series called That's Hard, and uh, we're going to spend the whole month of October talking about hard things because that's real life. Real life is hard. It has challenges, and we are not exempt as Christians from the hard things. I mean, Jesus himself, the night before he would be kept, captured and ultimately beaten and hung on a cross, he was in a garden in Gethsemane praying, and the scriptures record that his sweat beads began to rupture underneath his skin, and drops of blood were coming from his body. It's scientifically proven now that those are moments before you're about to die, the agony and the stress that's coming across your body. And he prayed, Father, if there's any other way, I want that way, but not my will but yours be done. And so Jesus did the ultimate hard thing, and he laid his life down so that we could have a life and life in abundance. Amen. So today, I want to go a little bit further in this topic and talk to you on a, on a topic that is heavy. I don't expect to get shouted down. I don't expect it to be one of those great amening moments necessarily, but I do expect that the Holy Spirit is going to do some work on the inside. And as we were praying earlier this morning, something that Pastor Steve prayed over me and prayed over our church was that we would have a stability in the internal environments of our hearts. And that's what we want to talk about today, emotional st- um, sobriety. And to help me, we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to be bringing up Kyle Hine. Kyle is the founder and the president of My Heroes Haven, located in Eaton Rapids, Michigan. Heroes Haven exists to lead others into emotional sobriety, suggesting a life of hope and healing from symptoms of PTSD and suicide ideation. Kyle is a living example and a model of how God can transform tragedy into testimony. Would you please welcome my friend, Kyle Hein. <laughs> Kyle, we had fun. We've already done this twice. Yeah. This is our third time. Already looking forward to it. Um, we have been meeting on and off for most of this year, and a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about today is condensed from these meetings and conversations as we talk about the kind of the work that he does routinely with those that have come out of the service industry, with dealing with PTSD or su- suicide ideology. And as the more he talked, I began to realize this is not just a, a service industry issue. This is our issue. This is the human issue. This is our challenge. When, when you encounter Jesus, and if you haven't yet, uh, today's your day. But if, if you haven't encountered Jesus yet, this is what happens in a moment. According to first, or 2 Corinthians 5, Jesus became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the very righteousness of God, the great exchange. And so we are uh, created in the image of God, and God himself is a three-part being, Father, Son, Spirit. Well, you and I are spirit, soul, and body. The moment of encounter, the awakening, the born-again experience happened in your spirit. You were made right before God, the very righteousness of God. But I, I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me that the moment I encountered Jesus, yes, my spirit was made perfect, but there was a lot of stuff in my emotion and my soul that still needed work. There's still a lot of things that happen to us in the emotional realm that we need help on. In fact, I think that's what's the great unifier of us all, that we all have challenges and traumas and events that we need help. And Kyle's got some tools that I'm going to be pulling out of him that I think that God's going to meet us here. And, and it's going to take us on a trajectory. It's going to help us to, to come into a better awareness, uh, a better experience. Because I, I don't know about you, let me just ask you, who wouldn't want a better experience with God? I want a better and better experience. And that comes through the journey. My opening passage this morning is going to be found in... First Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. Peter says, be sober... Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Many of your translations use, instead of the word sober, it uses sober-minded, which is actually a better translation. It's more articulate, because when we hear the word sober, we we tend to categorize it into one particular area. To be sober-minded, it also means to be free from the influence of intoxicants. To be, uh, he says, to be vigilant, or uh, to be, yeah, to be sober, be vigilant, meaning that be awake, be alert. Now, I know none of you because y- you guys are as pure as the wind driven snow. <laughs> so you're just going to have to use your imagination, okay? But out of the, the other three services, there was quite a few of them that could identify with this. And, um, it's, it's simply this. If you've ever been 
intoxicated, you've never, if you've been not sober, you would know that you're not really awake. You're, you're, some things are, things are happening around you that, that maybe you wouldn't recognize. And so what Peter is saying here, to be sober-minded, be awake. Don't take, this, uh, don't take this lightly. Be alert to what's going on because your enemy, the adversary, which is what the word Satan means, adversary, is like a devil going about seeking whom he might devour. A few years ago, I did some research on lions, and it was interesting to discover for me that the male lion, when they release a roar, it's so loud that it can be heard five miles away. So the male lion will get out in front of a pack of their prey if they're going after impalas or something, and the male lion will get in front of them and then release this roar that's so intimidating that their prey turns around and runs away. Now, you would think the king of the jungle, being the, 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 the most uh, strengthened or strong, aggressive cat that he is, that he would just run and chase him down. Well, he doesn't have the speed, and he doesn't have the longevity. What he does have is intimidation. And this is what I discovered. It's the female lions that are lying in wait for the impalas to run into them. And so this is what our enemy does. He's got a roar, and he's hoping that you're intimidated enough to turn around and go the opposite direction only to walk into the trap. This adversary, the devil, it does not say that he can devour whomever he's looking for whom. Any opportunity that I can give, I give uh, uh, some, some speak to this, I like to make the devil small and Jesus big. He doesn't have the power to come in and just destroy everything in your life. He is an adversary, so he, he can have access to what you yield to. He can have access to what you give response to, but he can't just have his way with you. We, we tend to give way too much credit to this, this adversary. When, someone said, when, when we say this, when someone's had too much to drink, we say that they're under the influence. Think about when someone's under the influence. You, can, you, you notice that they talk different. You notice that they walk different. When someone's under the influence, they look different. And you might think that I would suggest that we shouldn't be under the influence, and I'm not suggesting that. I'm just asking you to question what are you under the influence of. Look at this, Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18, Paul says, don't be drunk on wine because that'll ruin your life. He says, instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be under the influence of of, of the wine, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And when you're under the, uh, the influence of the right thing, it changes the way you talk. It changes the way that you walk, and it changes the way that you look. He goes on to say in verse number 19, it says, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your heart, in your emotion, in your soul. All of us, I would suggest, have a song. That's on repeat. And not all of us are having spiritual songs and hymns unto the Lord. That song on repeat is influencing the quality of your life. And so when we understand this, when we're, we're not settling for the substitutes, we're not being intoxicated by the wrong thing, but under the influence of the Holy Spirit, it begins to change the internal dialect and song of your heart. Verse number 20 says, And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks for everything. That's hard stuff right there. So before I go further, let's just kind of redefine sober. Being sober is not merely abstaining from alcohol. Being emotionally sober is the ability to live in the present, and I'll add, and enjoy it. To live in the present. If, if you are at peace, if you are able to live in the present and enjoy it, you're going to find, you're going to look for escapisms. You're going to look for things that would try to get you out of the experience that you're having. And my encouragement, as we take you on this short journey, that you would find, find that what we're saying is true, and that if we'll give way to Jesus, that we can begin to live in a present state that's filled with joy and life, and life in abundance. It's called emotional sobriety. So Kyle, in many of our conversations, you've, you've used a couple of phrases that I'd like you to help elaborate on. One of them was an emotional hangover. And then I'd like you to talk a little bit more about what it looks like to be emotionally sober. So when you first hear those two words or those questions, emotional hangover and emotional sobriety, it can hit hard. There, there's maybe 
uh, inside you right now, like, I'm, I'm really nervous, this is uneasy, what are, what are they going to talk about? And um, as far as the definition goes, I had something happen last night that I'd like to share, and I don't think it's any coincidence. I had my kids in the backseat of my truck, and we were driving. Uh, my son's eight, my daughter's six, and we had an accident outside of our house uh, a few months ago, and there was alcohol involved. And um, the kids just saw, you know, the, the police and other things happening and trying to explain what happened to them in their innocent minds was, was really hard. So this was, I would say, out of nowhere. We're just driving, and my daughter starts talking about this. And they, they mention the word alcohol. And then my son turns to her, eight years old, and he said, you know, you know, Piper? He goes, alcohol. It makes it so you don't know what you're doing. And I was like, there it is. There's the answer. And, and when we talk about emotional sobriety and, and why that is so important, that was out of the mouth of, of babes. That was out of these young children. And all of us in here has had life happen. Insert right. your age here. We've all had these things happen, turmoil, life events, expectations, things that happen in our life that build up into what we're talking about is an emotional hangover, meaning we haven't dealt with these things. And so this morning... We're going to look at what it's like to invite you to the possibility of to, to start to open the, the floodgates, maybe, of that healing. And so when I think of emotional sobriety and some of the characteristics, attributes that we might have, is one of, is what my kids did. That, that true, authentic, childlike faith. And how I'm a little envious of that. Is anybody else in here, like, a little jealous of it? Well, the thing is, we can get back to that. That's where there's, there's extreme hope in that. So what does that look like? to live a true, authentic life before the stuff happened and live that through Jesus. That's so powerful. So nobody in this service would probably understand what it's like to be hungover, but um, hungover is the effect of, of abusing an intoxicant, right? So what, hap what happened yesterday shows up today. So an emotional hangover, if I heard what you said right, is when the effects of yesterday are showing up in your present today, right? Yeah. So a good question to ask with that is, is what is that costing you? What things, what responses are we having to people? I think of Jesus's ministry, and he had his, uh, one of his responsibilities, his ability to respond was very well. Mm -hmm. And when we're living a life that's based off of story or ex expectations or, or, or should-haves, God should have done this, he shouldn't have taken my kid, he, sh he shouldn't have... Uh, he should have saved this marriage. He should have done all these things. We start to run this self-will riot of our own fixed way of being, and it starts to, to build up, and we live this life having an emotional hangover. And mm -hmm. this has an extreme cost to our, our well-being. Yeah. So we, we, we talk about different ways we practice meditation. And sometimes people get nervous about the word meditation. Listen, you all meditate. I promise you. You, you, oftentimes we mistake worrying. Uh, you know, we, we think about all the things that we have to do, all the things that we're concerned about, yet you still go to work, right? You still made dinner. You said all these things. Meditation is just doing inventory of what you have or what you want. Meditation, I like to insert, is like marination. The longer you meditate on something, the more the magnified it gets. So would you, let's lead these guys through just a, a short meditation as we go a little bit further. Does that be all right with you? Yeah, that, with meditation, so many times we throw prayer out there, right? We, right. We, we pray to God, but how often do we just sit and listen? Do we just sit and stop and marinate what he has to say or what we're looking to, um, some aspirations that we might have in our lives? So as we go into this, I want to encourage everybody that this message is a message of freedom Amen. and of hope. It, it's not about what happened or being stuck there. It's actually opposite. It's about how to get unstuck and what that looks like and how to come to terms and, and deal with life on life's terms. So as we go into this, I want to share a quick example. I ran into, into a, a friend of mine who was a firefighter. And no coincidence, out of the blue, he came up to me and he goes, Kyle, he goes, when I first started my career, some of the stuff that I saw, and this isn't just about service members or about me. This is, insert your thing here, this is all of us. And he stopped and he looked at me and he goes, there was some stuff that happened that made me question the existence of God. Anybody else have just have something happen? Like, I'm saved, but I'm suffering. Like, there's stuff that's happening. And then he goes, time went on, and then I saw stuff that it, there's no question that there is a God. There has to be a God. But what about the in-between? It gets super confusing. 
and we start to do things in our life to make it make more sense. And so I want us to look as we go into this next portion of meditation is that maybe, just maybe, the now that we have here explored is no other will. Maybe no other will but his will. Set our will aside, set our pride aside, and see what that looks like for no other will. Yeah. So if I could invite you to stand, the second service did this. And again, there's no shame, no guilt, anything like that here this morning. So I just want to take this opportunity, and, and maybe before we start, you're thinking, this stuff is for the person next to me, or in front of me, or behind me. And the reality is, maybe, maybe it's your turn. Maybe it's time to, to dive deep in the walls of those heart. And maybe, maybe inside that heart, you created things based off of unfair circumstances in your life. So we're going to take some time about you to explore what that looks like before we move forward during this, this journey, okay? So if you could, just, just close your eyes. If you want, this is to, to limit distractions around you. And I just want you to put yourself in a good space. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're nervous. You're, not, you're, you're surrounded by love. And that's all we are, is love. And so I want you just to sit with that for a little bit. And I want you to create an arena, if you will, around you. Just a space where you feel safe. And you can invite somebody in there. Don't worry about the crowd that's around you. Maybe all of a sudden you're thinking about this and another thought comes in. Just put that, so that thought aside and get back to the now. No other way. And how is this going to work? If, as I'm in my arena that I'm creating... As I'm in this space looking around, we're going to be honest with ourselves, open, and willing. So I think it's time for a lot of us to have a change. So just sit with that. And what I want you to do next is just picture three podiums in front of you, whatever that looks like. There's spot number one, there's spot number two, and there's spot number three. And this game is up to you. I want you to look at number one and ask yourself the question and envision, actually envision what do you want? It's the first question. What do you want? What aspirations do you have? What desires have been put in your heart, but somehow you pushed them away because maybe you're living in an emotional hangover? What do you want? Maybe you're here and nobody's ever asked you that question. What do you want? And number two, the second podium, I want you to envision what's going on there is what do you need? And I just encourage you to bring the what do you need before God. You know, sometimes we, we look at God, and I know in my life, I've put a, a leash on him, saying, God, you can only do this because you didn't show up before, you didn't do this, and again, that's my way. First, what do you want? What do you need? And then number three, look at that podium, be in this moment, is what are you willing to do to get there? Sometimes it's accepting that there's a time for a change and, and maybe nobody else is going to do it for you. But it'd be a good time to invite Jesus in to start to help. As you slowly envision this, we're going to start to come back as Pastor Phil speaks to us. You can go ahead and find your seat. The final question was, what are you willing to do? I have a lot of conversations with my kids and to be honest with you, I learn as much from my kids as my kids learn from me. And one of the conversations I was recently having with my two sons, my youngest one, specifically Gideon, we were talking about um, things that we don't like that are going on in our lives. And sometimes it's the result of bad decisions, uh, being undisciplined, uh, just getting off track, getting into the weeds. And one of the compliments I paid to him was that I appreciate very much that when he identifies an area in his life that he doesn't like or that's out of bounds, he's willing to do what it takes to get back in track and to adjust. I, I think that's a big move. That's, that, that alone is a life lesson that we would all desire, I believe, to, le to learn. And, and I said, well, as we began to elaborate, he said this to me. He said, we need to decide to suffer different. We can make our suffering matter. He, what he was saying is, I might be dissatisfied. I don't like this part of my life, or I don't like what this is becoming. It's causing me to suffer. I can suffer in this, and it gets me nowhere. It makes it worse. Or I can suffer different and make it matter. Meaning that I can be disciplined even though it's harder. I, I can make a different decision, create some boundaries even though it's harder. But this time, my suffering matters. And I just want to ask you, are, is the suffering that you're going through needless? Are you staying there? Because I want you to have permission. To, I need you to know you don't have to stay there. 
that it can change and we can make, it, make our suffering serve even us. So let's elaborate just a little bit more on that. Can you talk just a little bit about how suffering and meaning are connected? Suffering and meaning. This is this will land on some people different. Every time I hear this, it lands on, on me differently. Is that uh, some of the suffering, we're, we're making up a lot of our suffering. Just to kind of cope with the things that we don't understand. And some of us might be here this morning. Me too, I've been, I've been in these moments where I'm living so far in the past, which equals depression. And I'm not talking about the clinical aspect of it. Just who here has heard of the good old days? Things used to be like this. Or pre-pandemic, it was like this. Well, we're not going back any of us in the past anymore. We're being called forward. Yeah. And the future being that of anxiety, focusing too far on the future and not being in, in the now. So all these things we might attach, we are meaning-making machines, as the slide says. We attach meaning to so many things, and rightfully so. Give yourself grace. You're a human being being human. Mm -hmm. There are things that we're not going to understand, and how cool is that? That shows me that there is a God, and I am, in fact, not him. Right. And so if I can just let go of the reins and let him take control of it, then maybe the game starts to shift. Maybe things are a lot different. So if I can give you an example of making meaning of is if I had a table in front of me and I put a red Solo cup, and I might look at that red Solo cup and living in my days before Christ, my BC days, and looking at it and say, I used to drink my favorite drink out of that. You know, I used to cope with that. And somebody else may say, well, that red Solo cup we had at my son's birthday yesterday who just turned five years old. And then somebody else that's never seen a red Solo cup is just like, that's oh, a cup. So we all have experiences we all has, have had things that happen, but based on whether we've accepted, accepted them, denied them, we allow those to catch up to it. We attach meaning to it, and we might not be able to cope, and we stuff it with other things in our lives. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the thing. Have you ever been going through the grocery store or been on the elevator, and there's a, there's a song playing in the sound system that takes you back to a memory? I mean, it's just a song, but we put meaning to it. We, we, we add meaning to things, they can become triggers and they begin to show up in our lives and maybe how we react to different people. Inside of, of the, the list of the fruit of the Spirit is a word that I really wrestle with. Any parents or grandparents remember Sesame Street when they go through the little song, one of these things don't belong? I feel like there's a word in the, the list of the fruit of the Spirit that don't belong. It's called long-suffering. Help, help us understand that in light of the rest of the fruit of the Spirit, what is long-suffering doing there? Yeah. So in Galatians 5.22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Here's the word that might not belong to some, or we think it shouldn't, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Now, when we look at that, and maybe we come into the realms of, of church or, or are hung up on religion, maybe, and some of these fruits that we see, because the Bible said they'll know us how. People will know us by our fruits. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we like, I can come to church and I can be real lovey, but I'm dying inside. I'm saved, but I'm suffering. And so we have all these components of it was we put on a smile and we we step away from our true authentic self instead of saying, hey, it's, it's okay to be hurting. It's okay to have these things. But when we look at long suffering or the ability to suffer well, and that can really show how Jesus works in us and abides in us and lives through us where we can have long suffering and. Imagine both of those. I'm going through something, but I still have joy. I didn't get my way, and I'm still gonna be faithful. Yeah. I'm gonna have peace. I'm gonna abide in these truths. And it's so powerful because it, some of these concepts are simple, not easy, right? Simple, not easy. Though we mean well, I think sometimes in church culture, we actually set people up to miss this. Yeah. Because you come into an environment like this, or you walk into the door, and the greeter's smiling. And then you come around other people, and they've got their best, their best countenance on. And there's this illusion that I'm the only one here suffering. Everyone else here has got it all together. They can't relate. Everything's easier for them. But for me, I, I can't be that way. So we just put on a mask, or we, we fictitiously go through, or fraudulently rather, go through this, presenting as though everything is just fine, when in reality, uh, we might actually be suffering. Here's, here's what I think that we've got to come to terms with, that trials and tribulations and troubles is part of the human condition. All of us, that's what evens the playing field. 
that we all are going to go through suffering and trials and challenges, but in the midst of it, we don't have to trade in our joy, our peace, uh, our, 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 how we love others or how we love ourselves. I mean, let's look at Jesus. Jesus declared something that doesn't usually preach real good, but it's true. <laughs> In John 16, it said, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. What did you say the, the root of that word, take heart, comes in? Yeah, when we look at the word heart, it stems from a, a word courage with a Latin backing of cur to mean to tell um, your story with a full heart. And so when I look at this, there's so many times that it's easier sometimes to just worship, worship Jesus instead of acting it out and being a Christian and doing the things he called us to do. So when I look at this and it says, but take heart, I need to figure out what story, what thing, what I'm sharing with other people. Is it my emotional hangovers? Is it my past? Is it different things? Is it my own will that's coming out of my mouth? Or is it the things that Jesus has done in my life? So at Heroes Haven, you, you, you have some, some people that come in that have some real traumatic uh, stories, real things that have happened to them. And you say something kind of harsh once in a while to bring reality. What, what is it you say in regards to the, their, what they've been through? Yeah, this one's, uh, it's hard to land on people, is what makes you so special? I mean, what a hard question to ask when we look at this and say, well, don't you know what I've been through? I, I've experienced some extreme trauma. If you only knew the heartache and the pain that I have, I don't. Jesus does. But what I do know is he said, I have told you all this so you may have peace in me, and that he overcame us. And so we start to dive into the solution. I think what he's saying, not only to that group, but we could be saying to our, us right now is, if you're going through something and, and you think it's only you, what makes you think you're so special? Right? I mean, you could, that, that's, it's hard to say it without it kind of having that attitude to it, but the reality is, that's what we all have in common. We're all going through something. We've all been through something. These are challenges in life. Has, has anyone in this room ever had a flat tire on their car or their truck? A good portion of you. Let me, let me ask those that raised your hand. Did you schedule that? <laughs> Was it like on your to-do list? No, usually it happens when you're dressed really nice or you're running late, Right? It happens when you don't expect it. Now, imagine you're doing a cross-country trip, and you're hundreds of miles away from home, and you get a flat tire. Did you just abandon the whole car because you got one flat tire? No? Well, how about this? Did you pull off to the side of the road and say, you know what, I didn't deserve this, and you're just going to sit there in that car indefinitely? <laughs> and as silly as that sounds... There are some of us in this room that an event happened and you parked along the side of the road of life and you haven't moved since. It happened, but you don't have to stay there. You don't have to be stuck. Talk just a little bit, Kyle, about the difference between pushing somebody who's stuck or pulling somebody who's stuck. You made reference to Eagle Days. I haven't been out there, but with trucks pulling other trucks around. I'm a bit of a closet redneck, yeah. yeah. I had the last service do this. If you just say parts of me real quick. Parts of me. Parts of me. It's like the, the car he gave an example of. Identifying that parts of us are damaged, that we do have things that have happened to us and coming, with ter or coming to terms with that. And when we look at the difference between pushing people who are stuck and pulling people out, if you can just imagine the truck analogy. If there was two large four-by-four four trucks and they're both in the mud trying to pull the other one out of the mud, what's going to happen? There's just going to be a lot of mud being flung all around. So if we can at least get one tire on a solid foundation, or maybe two tires, it starts to give hope to pull that other truck out. And that sounds like a, one of our responsibilities that we talked about earlier. Absolutely. You see, if you're in the mud, one of the benefits of coming out of the mud, not being stuck, is that you can be on a firm foundation. His name is Jesus. And now, as a part of coming out of there, you don't push somebody out of the mud. If you do that, you're both going to go back in the mud but you pull them out. And so getting on our firm foundation, which is Jesus, is not just for your benefit, it's to also help reach others. Uh, you make a distinction between problems and situations. In fact, you said you don't have any problems. Yeah. If we go back to the now, no other will, and we're going into the, the present moment, just think about that for a second. What problems do you have right now? 
I say, well, Kyle, you don't know when I go home what I'm facing or what I have to go to at work tomorrow. Well, that hasn't happened yet. That's anxiety. That's the future. What about now? And so the level in which we resist our acceptance to what happened is going to be the level of pain that we experience. Wait a minute. I, acceptance. Are you implying that I'm to accept what happened to me? How, how many does that feel good about? No, it was wrong. I, I was a victim. I didn't ask for this. This wasn't supposed to. I want justice. In fact, I want everyone to know how bad that event hurt me. How, how can you ask me to accept it in order to move free? I think that comes back to playing God at times again because it, it did happen. And this isn't taken away from the trauma or anything that happened with it. But if it already happened, what other choice do we have? We can accept it and be stuck in the mud with other folks who are stuck in the mud, or we can decide, as Gideon said, right? We can yeah. decide to do something about it. And God calls us forward. Holy Spirit calls us forward. And, right. and that's a life that we should be moving towards. James 4.10 says, put down your own efforts to fight for your rights. Let him lift you up out to the dignity of his presence. Part of accepting it, maybe it'd, be, it'd feel better on you as it felt better on me when we talked about, we have to acknowledge it. And the longer you fight for the justice and the longer you fight for everyone else knowing and the, the, the longer you fight for your rights, the longer you stay stuck in the event. It's part of the healing process. And it's not about you doing it. It's not about you doing uh, the, all of the labor, all the work. Did you bring your phone to this service by chance? No, yeah, talk, to, talk about your phone. I don't have my phone on me, um, but who here has a broke phone? Cracked screen, anything like that. If you saw my phone, it's, it's pretty beat up, and I leave it that way, and that's my choice. I need to go get it fixed. But if any of you, I'm going to use an iPhone for an example because that's what I have. If I decided tomorrow to go get that fixed, am I going to go take it to Meyer or Walmart? I don't even want to go to one of these, you know, you break, we fix places. I just, I want to, where do I need to go? To Apple. I need to go back to the source. And once I start to get it fixed, and, different, and it might even be a cracked screen, but I can tell you it might seem so small, but after having a cracked screen, it's going to be so much more clear. Yeah. You're going to notice the difference. So if there's a broken area of your life, you don't take it to just anybody. You take it to the manufacturer. Amen. Right? Amen. Psalm 40, verse number 2, he stooped down to lift me out of danger from the desolate pit I was in out of the muddy mess I had fallen into. Now he's lifted me up into a firm, secure place and steadied me while I walk along his ascending path. The beauty of coming out of the pit is that you get to elevate and you go higher and higher in God. Now up to this point, I, I'm, you still have options. You, it's a free will situation here. You can decide to stay in your pit and maybe you want to hang on to this. Like, uh, you said earlier, some of us hold on to it because we find attention in it. We find, we, we find some type of identity in our trauma. But if you're in that pit and you choose to not go out, I'll tell you, there's a few things that you're probably doing. One of them, because you're not living present and enjoying it, one of the ways that you might be uh, trying to make it is by numbing yourself. Numbing uh, can happen all kinds of ways. Sometimes it's through substance abuse, but I know other people that numb themselves in other ways. And here's what a counselor once told me just recently, actually. She said, when you numb, you don't just numb the area that you're trying to avoid. It numbs everything. It even numbs the things in your life that you want to enjoy. So if you try to escape with something, a substitute savior, it might work for a moment or it might numb that area, but it'll also touch all the valuable areas of your life. Well, maybe you're not into numbing, but, but you're, you protect it. My, my son Isaiah on Labor Day weekend, uh, Labor Day, he, he decided to go buy a longboard, which is a long skateboard. He's not a longboarder or a skateboarder, but whatever. I mean, go ahead, do your thing. So he goes and buys it. Later that day, for his next big trick, he decides to put a strap on the back of a car and get pulled behind the car. At 6 o'clock at night, the phone rings. Dad, I did something stupid which I found out then he had a broken wrist and broken elbow and a whole bunch of road, uh, uh, road rash. 
And so if you saw him afterwards, you saw that he had a blue sling on, and that blue sling served as a couple of, of uh, purposes. It kept it from being moved. It kept it from, from being hit. It protected it from being used. It, in fact, in when, if you saw him walk into the room with his arm like this, with a blue sling, everybody knew that it was some type of trauma to the arm. And maybe you have an event, and you're trying to protect it, but that sling doesn't heal it. It just protects it. And if you think, oh, yours is invisible, I promise you, when you walk into the room, everybody sees the thing that you're trying to protect. Maybe you're the one who tries to look good so that you don't look bad, or you're the person who tries to dominate so that you're not dominated. Either way, these are the options that we have if we're not willing to allow the healer to touch these spaces. Let's bring this in for a landing. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 19. This is what life looks like if you decide you want to stay in the pit. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfying wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or to be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and top-sided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. Ugly parodies of community. I could go on, Paul says. This isn't the first time I've warned you, you know. If you decide to stay on the side of life's road with the flat tire because of an event, or you decide because you want justice and things need to be made right, you're still in the pit. This is what life looks like. But if you would be courageous enough to say yes to the healer, this is what it might look like to you. This is what blows my mind when we choose to be done suffering. It said in Galatians 5, to 23, it says, but what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives much the same way the fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affections for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that at a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Doesn't that sound so much better? It's like you, you have to ask yourself, why? And what did you say when, when you're done suffering? The ball is in your court. The beauty of, of our rescuer is that he didn't just transform your spirit to make heaven that we're called to a life of abundance, that he wants to touch every aspect and every area of our lives. And I pray as we do the hard things. You know, uh, Kyle pointed out that this message is not entitled, That's Easy. It's called That's Hard. These are the hard things, but if we're willing to acknowledge them, we're willing to move in, and we might be able to experience something new, a life that's present, not trying to numb out, not trying to escape, but to actually live really live. I want to invite you to stand with me as we close in prayer. Father, we pray right now for each person entrusting you, Holy Spirit, to minister in ways that we know only you can. That across this room, we have varying experiences and people with different experiences from their past or what they're going through today. As Kyle said, this was intended and still is intended to be a message of hope and healing and freedom. A life that's yoked to a God who loves, who helps carry burdens, who leads and guides us into places of freedom. So I pray for courage. I pray for courage in each one of our hearts to surrender, to yield, to say yes. Yes to Jesus the one who descended, the one who showed love by laying down his life, who made a path, who opened the door, that we could experience something new, a kingdom that looks different than the kingdom of this world, and a life that looks different 
Lord, I pray that the ones that have come here today searching and seeking, that have yet to encounter you, I pray that this would be a set-up moment that we might all experience the newness of God today. It's the courage to say yes to Jesus, acknowledging that he came, that he died in our place, that on that torturous cross he bore the affliction of our shame, of our guilt, and our sin. He's invited us to exchange the old for the new, to receive life for death freedom for bondage. It's a yes to Jesus that begins the journey where we not only have an experience on a Sunday morning, but we we begin a life that lasts forever. So Lord, may that be the anthem of this whole house. A yes to Jesus. Father, may we follow the, the words of Peter. He says to cast our cares on him cast our cares upon God because he cares and we're going to leave them and we're going to walk away and with you in Jesus name amen